let us gavel in and begin. At this hearing, uh, we are fully virtual, so we have to address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice you, you have not unmuted yourself, I may ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will then unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time is expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member and members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. So good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to our second CJS hearing of the year. Today, we welcome Michael Horowitz, Inspector General for the Department of Justice, a position he has held since 2012. Uh, he has also served as chair of the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, which is comprised of all 73 federal inspectors general. Prior to leading the Office of Inspector General, he spent a decade in private practice, during which time he also served as a commissioner on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Uh, and from 1989 to 2002, he served in a range of significant positions as a federal prosecutor and within the department's criminal division. The Inspector General occupies a unique position with responsibility to oversee the operation and performance of the Department of Justice and promote the department's integrity, efficiency, and accountability. This is especially important now when we are struggling to recover from a global pandemic. In 2020, uh, OIG, Office of Inspector General, received $2 million to oversee DOJ administration of uh, $1 billion in CARES Act funding. This is on, on top of its important work in overseeing a sprawling $33 billion department. But we will be especially interested in hearing your observations about how DOJ is addressing its COVID-19 challenges and correcting any missteps it might have made during the pandemic, including its administration, as I said, of a billion dollars in CARES Act funding. In its 2013 edition of its top management and performance challenges for the department, leading your list of six priorities, General Horowitz, were the growing crisis in the federal prison system and safeguarding national security consistent with civil rights and liberties. Seven years later, the lead was quote, public confidence in law enforcement and protecting civil liberties, unquote, and, quote, use of sensitive investigative authorities, unquote, followed by planning and response to a global pandemic and a safe, secure, and humane prison system. Now, I know these lists don't represent a priority order. It's, it's hard not to be struck by the consistency of these challenges uh, while noting the nuances and the changes that seem to resonate with the times. Uh, I will be interested to hear your thoughts on the persistent nature of these challenges in addition to what specific steps are being taken to ensure they are being addressed. Uh, I also expect today we'll cover a wide range of topics in addition to those already mentioned. We'll begin with a focus on DOJ's performance in handling the pandemic, 
and also focus on the challenges DOJ faces in dealing with the tragic events such as the January 6th insurrection and the rise of violent extremism in our nation. We'll want to hear about how DOJ is dealing with other significant challenges facing the department, such as efforts by the department to improve police and community relations, to advance civil rights and civil liberties, racism, hate crimes, and the rise of violent crime in our cities, uh, the, the never-ending scourge of opioid trafficking, foreign influence and cyber threats, and the challenge of protecting voting rights and institutional integrity. So once again, uh, welcome Inspector General Horowitz. We look forward to your testimony. And at this point, uh, I wanna turn to my distinguished ranking member, Mr. Adderholt for his opening statement. Well, good morning, and uh, Chairman Cartwright, and it's good to be with uh, the uh, subcommittee uh, virtually this morning, and I appreciate your yielding for this uh, hearing that we're going to have this morning. I am pleased um, to be here to discuss the Department of Justice Management uh, performance challenges and COVID response with our witness, uh, the Honorable Michael Horowitz. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, we, uh, let me just say we value your efforts to promote integrity and uh, efficiency at the Department of Justice. And of course, we have worked with you for many years now and uh, we can attest to you that you have led by example. Um, you have led the Department of Justice, uh, Department of Justice Office of Inspector General for I think uh, uh, close to nine or 10 years now and you've proven yourself to be effective uh, as well as impartial and dedicated to your work. And we appreciate your willingness to answer uh, sometimes hard questions. And we appreciate your uh, command of all the many, many programs and activities at the Department of Justice, uh, from the matters that dominate the national headlines down to your detailed oversight of your own annual budget. And I'd like, I, and I would be remiss if I did not express our gratitude uh, to you also uh, for serving in a most critical role during an unprecedented time. And that's your uh, role in leading the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, uh, heading up the effort to prevent and to detect waste, fraud and abuse and mismanagement and to mitigate risk associated with trillions of dollars in federal spending. That is no small task, uh, but we know you are up to the challenge. I look forward to the opportunity to discuss uh, with you today several challenges that face the Department of Justice, including the crisis at our southern border uh, challenges facing the Department of Justice detention components and the scourge of a child exploitation. Uh, Chairman Cartwright, thank you again for holding the hearing today and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Adderholt. Um, well, Inspector General Horowitz, uh, you are recognized at this time for your opening remarks. Uh, this is not your first rodeo. You've testified many times in front of congressional committees and subcommittees. So you know it's a five minute rule. Please try to keep your statement to five minutes. And as always, your full written statement will be included in the record. You are recognized, Inspector General Horowitz. Thank you very much, Chairman Cartwright, Ranking Member Adderholt, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on management and performance challenges at DOJ and its COVID-19 pandemic response. Um, in our most recent top management challenges report, um, as the chairman indicated, we identified nine specific challenges facing the department. In light of recent events, I'm gonna briefly focus on five of those challenges. They are countering domestic and international terrorism, preventing, uh, protecting against cyber related threats, strengthening public confidence in law enforcement, responding to the global pandemic and managing the federal prison system, a challenge that's been on every one of the reports since I've been Inspector General. First, countering domestic and international terrorism. Enhancing national security and countering domestic and foreign terrorism threats remain top priorities for DOJ and for good reason. The OIG is continuing to conduct vigorous oversight of DOJ's efforts to address these growing threats. Indeed, shortly after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, the OIG initiated a review to examine DOJ's role and activity in preparing for and responding to those events. And as our past oversight demonstrates, the terrorism risk includes threats from both domestic violent extremists and homegrown violent extremists. 
We will continue to closely monitor and oversee DOJ's counterterrorism programs and activities. Second, cyber related threats. The recent solar winds incident demonstrates the vulnerability of IT systems and presents a clear warning that DOJ must remain vigilant. I'm coordinating with my IG counterparts at agencies impacted by the solar winds incident and assessing how we can best conduct additional oversight work in this area. My office also continues to conduct our periodic audits of DOJ IT systems pursuant to the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, or FISMA. Those reviews regularly identify important recommendations to improve DOJ's IT security posture. Third, strengthening public confidence in law enforcement. As events over the past year demonstrate, strengthening public confidence in law enforcement and protecting individual civil liberties is of paramount importance. We're currently reviewing the DOJ's response to events in Washington this past summer and separately investigating use of force allegations involving DOJ personnel in Portland, Oregon. Additionally, DOJ must ensure that in exercising its law enforcement authorities, its components adhere to policies designed to protect individuals' privacy. Our December 2019 review of certain FISA warrants found fundamental and serious deficiencies. <clears throat> Further, OIG follow-on report identified significant compliance concerns with the FBI's FISA factual accuracy documentation process. The OIG is continuing to monitor the DOJ's and FBI's implementation of recommendations from these reports. Fourth, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. The DOJ faces a variety of challenges in this area including preventing the spread of the virus among federal inmates and detainees in BOP and U.S. Marshals custody. The DOJ also must effectively manage about a billion dollars, as the chairman noted, in CARES Act funding and operate the nation's immigration courts in a manner that minimizes risk while preserving individual rights. Over the past year, the OIG has devoted substantial resources to these oversight efforts, from conducting 16 remote inspections of BOP BOP facilities to reviewing US, the Marshall Service COVID response. In the coming months, we'll release our oversight, res, uh, our oversight reports on the Executive Office for Immigration Review's response to the pandemic, the BOP's use of home confinement, and OJP's handling of the CARES Act grant funding. Fifth, maintaining a safe, secure, and humane prison system. This has been a regular challenge we've identified, and most recently, we found that Despite a declining inmate population, the BOP continues to experience significant staffing shortages of correctional officers, medical staff, and other positions. These shortages and associated safety issues required continued vigilance and is an area the OIG continues to conduct important oversight in. Lastly, I wanna thank the subcommittee for its continued bipartisan support of our office which has advanced our ability to promote accountability and deter future misconduct. The support has enabled us to better manage the growing volume of critical digital forensic evidence we need for our work, take its steps to modernize and secure our IT infrastructure, build a data analytics capability to advance our audit and investigative efforts, and timely respond to increased, the increase in whistleblower complaints that we have received. The complexity and volume of our work, however, continues to grow as do demands on our cyber forensic capabilities, our IT infrastructure and security, and our ability to conduct classified audits, reviews, and investigations. We look forward to continuing to work with each of you to address these issues. We appreciate, again, the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Well, thank you for your testimony, Inspector General. And we now move to the question period. Uh, I'll recognize myself for uh, the first five minutes of questions. Um, in 2013, your office completed an exhaustive review of the voting section of Civil Rights Division that built on previous reviews by your predecessor. Your analysis spotlighted management, policy, and personnel issues that hindered DOJ from carrying out its historically prominent mission in protecting all citizens' voting rights. And we're not gonna go into that report in detail right now, but I have to observe uh, there couldn't be a more critical time 
than right now for a strong active Justice Department effort in this area. The 2013 Supreme Court's Shelby County decision helped open the floodgates to an increasing number of administrative and legislative actions in states and localities nationwide, uh, often under the guise of addressing non-existent voter fraud so-called fraud to make it harder for citizens to register and cast their votes. Well, of course, it, it may be a good idea to update the Voting right, Rights Act. Uh, in the near term, we do depend on the Justice Department to take a lead in forceful action to combat suppression and protect efforts to facilitate the exercise of this basic right of democracy, the right to vote. I'm going to ask you three questions, uh, and I'm going to get them all out so I don't have to interrupt you in our five minutes first session. Number one, how would you assess the performance of the department in general and the voting rights section in particular in carrying out its responsibilities to protect voting rights in the past two election cycles? Number two, in its fiscal year 2021 budget and performance summary, the Civil Rights Division highlighted many missions, but only a one-word reference to, to voting, protecting the rights of military service members. What performance measures, investigation, prosecution, settlements are available to help evaluate the division's performance in this critical area? What statistics would you point to? And if more data is needed, what metrics would you recommend the department collect? And number three, do you think the Civil Rights Division has the capacity to be proactive in countering potential voter suppression actions, either through litigation or other means? And if not, what steps could be taken within current law to increase their effectiveness in such efforts? Take it away, Inspector General. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so all very important questions and agree with you, this is a fundamental issue with our democracy is the right to vote. Um, let me take the last one first and, and then double back to the others. Um, I do think the department has a series of tools available to it um, in the voting section to be proactive. I think that is one of the things we look at regularly when we do our reviews is understanding um, how the department is using its authorities and whether it is simply sitting back waiting for problems to come to it, or as I think management of any department program um, requires, thinking about where uh, the law and needs are going, where issues are developing and taking steps to, to address that. Clearly, um, the department needs to operate within the bounds of the law statutory law, Supreme Court interpretation of it. Um, I'm going to um, avoid um, giving them legal advice because that's clearly not something that inspectors general are there to do, um, to give the legal advice. Um, but I do think there is the ability to look at these issues proactively and it's important to do that. With regard to the um, FY21 um, uh, report that you referenced, um, I. I certainly think voting is such a fundamental issue that it requires careful consideration and analysis and more than um, I would suggest a word um, in a report. Um, the, um, this has been a challenge we've seen actually also across the board in terms of performance measures and metrics. Um, the department does ge generally does not do a good job in that space. And we could talk about it in a variety of different contexts here. I think one of the things that the department tends to do, and having been a prosecutor, I saw this in US Attorney's office, offices, is talk about output. Well, we indicted X number of cases this year, 5% more than last year, therefore we must be doing a better job. That's not the measure. The measure is, are you addressing the need and the issues that, and, and having an impact in those spaces, not just you know, putting more people in jail, arresting more people, that can be one measure, but certainly not the sole measure. And I think in the voting space, it's important for the department when it puts together its strategic plan to think about what those, what, what they should be looking at beyond simply outputs. How many cases did we bring? That shouldn't be the measure. The measure should be, how do we impact the ability of, of, the, of the public and citizens to exercise their right to vote? And I think frankly, their best position to think through those issues we're very well positioned to look at whether they've done an effective job of that 
and I'm happy to, I, we've already engaged with them on this issue and happy to engage further with you on and your staff on. And then finally, how to assess how they've carried out their responsibilities in the last two election cycles. Um, I, I, first of all, I, they have responded to our earlier recommendations from the report you referenced and made those changes. I'm, I can report that we have not seen the kind of complaints that led us to undertake that earlier review, which were quite concerning about uh, the various abuses and issues that were arising within the section. So I think from that standpoint, there's an ability to have some comfort. Um, but um, I think the challenge, and we've talked to the division about this, is in light of Shelby County and understanding where district court and other courts were going in terms of implementing that decision and what space was still available. I think from what we heard from the department, it took some time to understand that. So um, I'm not sure, frankly, as I sit here, where we are in this past cycle, we'd have to go back and look at them given how recent it is. And in terms of 2016, it was so soon after Shelby that I'm not sure, and I will ha be happy to follow up with the voting rights section, as to how um, much they had had, whether they had had sufficient time to react to the Shelby County decision to undertake whatever changes they needed to take in advance of the 2016 election. But I'm, uh, I, I will follow up with the division. We have not done oversight work in that space. And I can certainly follow up and get back to you, Mr. Chairman, on that issue to try and look at and see what they did in 16 and what they did in 20, as well as in the intervening 2018 congressional election. Thank you, Inspector General. That is hugely important. And let us continue to follow up on that. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Adderholt for his questions. Oh, thank you. Um, again, uh, good morning, uh, General Horowitz. Good to be with you today. Um, I uh, want to ask a little bit about the uh, the border crisis, um, focus a little bit on that. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, as you know, took um, real specific steps uh, to try to end the pull factors that incentivize illegal immigration into the United States. Uh, for example, President Trump implemented the Remain in Mexico policy uh, pursuant to stat statutory authority to send a message to foreign nationals that simply that uh, because they make it to the United States uh, and claim asylum, they will not be released into the United States while awaiting their immigration court proceedings. Uh, my first question would be to you is, uh, do you think the termination of, of this particular policy has revived this the, the prior pull factor that we had? So, um, Congressman, given our oversight responsibilities at DOJ on the immigration are focused on the Executive Office of Immigration Review because DHS has primary responsibility for charging decisions and border control, um, I'm not frankly in a position to speak about how the Remain in Mexico policy either impacted uh, stops at the border um, previously, or the removal of it is doing that now, frankly. I can certainly follow up with our counterparts at DHS OIG to see what they're seeing. And I've certainly seen their earlier reports um, as we were doing some of ours on EOR's handling of this. But at this point, given where CBP exists, which is at DHS and not at DOJ, I'm going to be limited in how much I, uh, insight I have personally into that issue. Did, did you see anything from the reports that you could share with us? Um, I, I don't know currently how this is playing out. I have seen reports that DOJ, DHS OIG previously has put forward identifying areas where those programs could be improved and you know addressed further on the border. Um, but I really have to defer to them on what they've found and analyzed because um, these are not oversight efforts we've undertaken at the border. We have looked at some issues about cooperation and work between FBI and DHS um, at the border um, on the law enforcement side, because that is also a DOJ responsibility, but, but not specifically on the DHS border control 
um, authorities. Oh, well, during the Trump administration, uh, you assessed that there was a, a lack of coordination between federal right. agencies with respect to immigration policies and procedure. And we're now seeing significant policy reversals of such as ending the remain in Mexico, as I mentioned, and a moratorium on removals. And uh, there, there appears to be uh, a uh, domino effect on uh, uh, migration, crime, and a struggle to to obtain uh, adequate resources. Has uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and, and maybe you can shed some light on this, ha has the uh, Department of Homeland Security coordinated with critical Department of Justice agencies, um, such as the United States Marshal Service, the U.S. attorneys, uh, and our immigration courts with regard to policy changes? And that, that has been an area we've looked at and have expressed some concerns recently, specifically in the um, in a report we did about coordination between FBI and DHS counterparts on border-related security and criminal issues. Um, and we recommended, for example, um, there that FBI and DHS, HSI in particular, enter into agreements and understanding so they could better conflict better coordinate and interestingly fbi agreed with our recommendation as did the department but hsi did not and so that recommendation actually remains open i know um, the prior deputy attorney general actually raised this issue and this concern about the unwillingness to enter into such an arrangement with dhs counterparts and that is still a problem today. And it's a problem I've heard about repeatedly, which is the um, potential conflicts between DOJ components and DHS components. And it is an area where we, we need to keep oversight of and leadership of both agencies need to follow. Okay, thank you. I, I say my time's almost up, so I'll wait till the next round to go for the next question. I thank my colleague, Mr. Adderholt, and uh, the, the chair recognizes uh, uh, Congressman Christ for five minutes. And uh, uh, Congressman Christ, you are muted. Matt, are you calling on me? This is, uh, uh, the chair has recognized Congressman Christ of Florida. Uh, and Congressman Chris, you are muted. All right, at this time, uh, we're gonna skip over and uh, recognize uh, Congressman Trone for five minutes of questions. Go ahead, Congressman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you today, uh, Inspector General Horowitz for joining us. And uh, thank you for the important role uh, that you play at the department in auditing programs and activities on mental health care. Uh, last year, I visited a state prison in my district that houses over 1,300 inmates. The facility, the warden told us they had a budget for two mental health professionals, but only one was currently on the job. They couldn't find another. This faculty was not part of a BOP, but it painted a picture of mental health treatment access you know, at our nation's prisons. As you may recall, in January 2020, Department of, and OPM granted the BOP authority to pay its physicians and dentists according to the Title 38 pay plan, which governs compensations for medical professionals at the VA. The result was higher pay than the BOP would have otherwise been able to offer. Your 2020 report on top management challenges for the department makes it clear that despite the increase in staffing uh, using the Title 38 pay led to 
uh, BOP healthcare staffing is still far below where it needs to be, especially due to COVID. COVID. Could you elaborate on what additional actions BOP should take to improve healthcare staffing levels, particularly mental health care professionals? Uh, thank you, Congressman. That's a very important question, an issue that we've focused on and have issued reports on our top management challenges and prior reports, identifying the mental health issue as a significant problem um, for treatment, not only of inmates while in prison, but the public needs to understand it, it, it is critical to helping inmates who will get out of jail in the federal system. Very few inmates are in there for life to transition to the, to the community. Um, these, these inmates will be getting out of prison. And so we all have an interest in making sure they're treated as they need to be treated. Um, and there is this perpetual staffing challenge for the BOP on the mental health side. I, I think first and foremost, what we identified was a commitment in terms of a need is a commitment to focusing on this issue and doing everything possible to address the staffing shortages. They are um, oftentimes institution specific problems. Some institutions have greater challenges than others. <clears throat> and so there isn't a one size fits all in a federal prison system that's 120 plus prisons all over the United States. Some in rural locations, some in urban locations. Um, and I think first and foremost, that is what has to occur, is that a dedicated focus to that issue in terms of staffing. We've also identified issues with regard to placing inmates in um, particular um, isolated housing units that tends to exacerbate mental health issues as another problem and concern that the BOP has to address because it's both a treatment problem, a staffing and a staffing problem, and, and, and both of those issues need to be I'm sorry, you're muted, Congressman. To help get them this focus, which we all agree is needed, and the sense of urgency, because the recidivism rates at 75% five years out is costing taxpayers, you know, 80 billion a year. You know, what should we in the Appropriations Committee and FY22 do to get them the resources to help with mental health and the incarcerated individuals? I, I think a couple things. First, recent GAO report highlighted the overall weakness in the BOP's assessment of its staffing needs. Um, that applies across the board. I, I think what we, the BOP needs to do is come before the committee, the department, and, and assess aggressively and effectively its staffing needs in each of these areas, mental health being a very, very specific one that it couldn't do and needs to come forward and say, this is our staffing expectations. We need to hit this target and, and at a minimum reach the 90% threshold, which is generally their standard, um, and figure out how to get actions taken to both um, identify potential applicants and get them on board in a timely manner through the challenges of the federal hiring system generally. I'm sorry, you're on mute, Congressman. Congressman, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, Congressman, you're on mute. I didn't hear the last question. Yeah, jumped on mute there. Um, I've got a slew of questions. We'll have to wait until we come back again because our time's expired right now. But call on me when you're ready to go again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Trone. And uh, at this time, the chair recognizes Congressman Ben Klein for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, Welcome, Inspector General Horowitz. It's good to see you. Um, appreciate uh, the Chairman and Ranking Member Adderholt for holding today's hearing. 
ensuring that our justice system is operating effectively and efficiently in accordance with the law is essential. And it's in, so important that we maintain transparency and accountability in government. I applaud the IG for his office's efforts to conduct aggressive and thorough oversight. Um, you know, when you're talking about addressing COVID, responding to COVID, uh, one of the areas that uh, has been of concern to me is the lockdowns that have been put in place by uh, my governor, several other governors have led to spikes in um, drug abuse. Uh, opioid addiction was already a problem in, in my district, um, but suicide rates, uh, domestic violence rates, uh, a number of unrelated uh, issues that have, have seen uh, an increase in problem in, in rates uh, since COVID. And uh, with regard to opioids, the Northwest Virginia Regional Drug and Gang Task Force reported just this week there have been at least 12 deaths and 41 non-fatal overdoses this year in the region. Three of those fatal overdoses and 13 non-fatal overdoses have occurred since March 16th. And uh, the increase is likely due to a combination of receiving federal stimulus money and the presence of fentanyl-laced heroin. Um, what is the Department of Justice doing to better coordinate with local law enforcement to combat this deep, deeply concerning increase in overdoses ravaging our communities? So uh, what we saw in, in our opiates re report that we issued um, two years ago now um, was the, the DEA, the department through the Drug Enforcement Administration, undertaking an effort really for the first time in a significant way to try and look at not just the law enforcement issues, but to look at it through the its regulatory landscape and partner with state and local officials at the law enforcement level and at the healthcare level. And so we saw they were doing a better job of that, but they were in a pilot program at that point and needed to expand that effort. That was one of the main issues we saw was in, um, the, the, the shift, again, from law enforcement to regulatory. But one of the concerns we had with the department's ability to respond was weaknesses in its data information and ability to assess that data. And so what we looked at uh, over the years you could quite clearly see as the ever increasing production thresholds were growing, which DEA is the one who allows to grow. Um, you could see that spike coming if you looked at and carefully assessed where numbers were going, not just deaths, but demands for increased production. And what we said in that report is the department and DEA needs to look for trends like you're saying, like you're referencing, and try and get ahead of them back to the earlier discussion I had with the chairman about being proactive, using the data to be proactive, partnering in a proactive way with local partners, because the, the folks from your county and your community are going to see this problem first. They're the ones you want to hear from. And I think there needs to be a lot more of that going on. And that's what our report said. Great. Um, in your testimony, you discussed the $850 million in grant funding DOJ received as part of the CARES Act. How is the DOJ and your office monitoring the disbursement of these grant funds to ensure that taxpayer resources are being administered and used for their intended purpose? So we've already done two, um, what I would say quick hit looks at that so that we could identify whether it was being managed effectively as initial stages. And we found generally it was by the Department's Office of Justice programs. The critical question is going to be, as we now look at it down the road, where the money went to, were the recipients and the sub-recipients using it appropriately? And frankly, in our past grant work, that's usually where we found the challenges for the department. Not so much on how the department's assessing grants and giving them out, but how the department was assessing whether the downstream recipients were using them appropriately, the grantees, the sub-grantees. And that's where our work is going to lead us to now, now that the money has been out. So the initial report back is the department has seems to have managed it effectively from its end in terms of getting it out. But we need to figure out if the money had the went to the right people, places, and it had the right impact. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Klein. And at this point, the, uh, the chair recognizes Congressman Mike Garcia for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Inspector General, for taking the time uh, with us today. Uh, I have several questions, but uh, perhaps we'll save some of them for the next round. The, the, the issue that uh, you addressed at the beginning about strengthening public confidence in, in our agencies at uh, really all levels of, of law enforcement, um, but, it, but obviously in this domain with, with what you have purview over, um, from an accountability, I, th I think that that goes both ways, not only in terms of uh, law enforcement conduct and uh, not abusing their power, not abusing uh, suspects uh, during the custodial phases, but but also making sure that we're holding folks who are committing crimes accountable. Uh, there, There's a perception that I, I hear very frequently, not only in my district here in Southern California, but also, you know, throughout the West Coast and in D.C., that uh, folks are, are frankly flabbergasted that we can have major cities in our country be uh, overcome by rioters for extended periods of time without really seeing, in their opinion, and the perception is enough law enforcement coming in to actually stop this this type of uh, of, of, of uh, civil unrest, riots, looting, and arson. We see examples in Portland where it's been now uh, nine months, three weeks, and three days. Of, of not just peaceful protests, but also looting and vandalism to small businesses over an extended period of time. We see in, in cities like Seattle, where we have city, you know, six city blocks worth of territory uh, being over overtaken by by rioters and, and creating these autonomous zones. Um, there, there seems to be an unanswered question as to how that can happen for such a long uh, period of time without seeing either the federal government get involved to the point where we're squashing this type of behavior, still allowing for peaceful protests, but not allowing the vandalism and the tens of millions of dollars that we've, we've incurred as a result of the, the civil unrest, the riots, the looting, and the arson. Um, in your opinion, are we doing enough at the federal government level within the DOJ and all the equities below that to, to, to in, ensure that we are earning the trust of, of our of our constituents and the public in, in terms of just law enforcement in these in these regards? Well, thank you, Congressman. And that is an issue that we're looking at both in connection with the events last summer, as well as the events at the Capitol, the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, is trying to understand those events from the DOJ perspective. And by the way, we are coordinating with our counterparts at the Interior OIG, which has authority over the Park Police, um, DHS OIG, which obviously has authority over Secret Service and other law enforcement, and the Department of Defense IG, which has obviously the National Guard. So we are looking to do some, um, we are looking at it from the DOJ perspective and coordinating with our counterparts across the IG community. Having said that, obviously, first and foremost, uh, the responsibilities at the local level and the federal government needs to be there to support and work co collaboratively with local law enforcement um, and not come in and um, as a general matter, unless you're protecting a federal courthouse or Congress or other locations like that to, to usurp federal law and local law enforcement. Um, there are questions that have been raised. I'll speak to DOJ specifically with regard to some of the events last year, which is how well prepared are DOJ law enforcement personnel to serve in what are traditionally local law enforcement responsibilities in dealing with civil unrest, issues at the Capitol, things like that. And, and that is also one of the issues we're looking at. It's not clear to us what kind of training, for example, BOP officers got before they were put in place, FBI official officers were put in place. Um, and, and so that's another question we're looking at. And is there is there an opportunity or benefit to look at potential venues to help shape decision making at least uh, or inform decision making at the lower uh, city levels, county levels, um, in the interest of of preventing these these what start as smaller protests and 
smaller episodes of, of, of looting and rioting be, from becoming longer extended periods. I mean, yes, it's a local issue, but over time, these start influencing other cities throughout our nation, and it becomes a federal problem really quick, right? Yeah, and this is where um, just the, the joint task forces are so critical at the, at the local level. And that's something we've been looking at from uh, the standpoint of FBI, which has task forces and obviously runs the Joint Terrorism Task Forces across the country, um, working with DHS. Um, the um, DEA has many task forces, as does ATF, for the respectively drugs and gun issues and violent crime issues. And, and one of the things I'll just mention we're looking at is uh, we have an audit that will be out soon on body-worn cameras. And I mentioned that even though it isn't perhaps obvious to people, why, what's the connection between body-worn cameras and the relationship of federal law enforcement to local law enforcement? It, it, there's a direct line now because as we all know, most large cities, most large police forces use body-worn cameras. Federal law enforcement does not. That has led to local law enforcement questioning participation in task forces. Because in some instances, it's local law, actually, that requires the body work cameras. And so it's very important for the federal law enforcement community to address that issue and to make sure it is working closely with their counterparts to deal with some of the challenges like body worn cameras that can come up that you might not think about in the first instance, but when you see this over and over again over the last several years, it's really quite critical to address and, and something that I think this committee and other committees will need to think about because one of the things we're hearing about as we're talking about this issue at the department is the resource issue and the cost issue, which, which as you know, you funded at the state and local level through the mm -hmm. department's Office of Justice Programs. They have given out over a hundred million dollars to support that, but it isn't happening at the federal level. Understood. Thank okay. you, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Garcia. And at this point, the chair uh, recognizes Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Thank chair. You. Um, last week, our subcommittee heard from the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons and one of the things that I'm zeroing in is the treatment of women, uh, particularly in the, in the federal, uh, the inmates, when it comes to receiving proper care and access to feminine hygiene products. In your testimony, you highlighted several remote inspections that evaluate the BOP's effort uh, to control COVID. Mr. Horwitz, based on the review of these reports, can you speak to any specific findings as associated with access to female hygiene products for inmates? And did you see any trends across the country? Because when we asked this question of the director, he did not, he said he would have to look into it and get back to us. So Congresswoman, that's a very important issue. We actually did a report shortly before the pandemic that specifically addressed some of the female health care issues in mm -hmm. prison, female inmate issues generally, but that specific issue as well. And as a result of that review, the BOP implemented a new policy with regard to feminine hygiene products, which was consistent with the recommendations and our views that we saw. Um, I can promptly get back to you on the current status of that. We mm -hmm. did not, I'll just mention as part of the pandemic, follow up specifically on that issue when we were doing our remote inspections because we already had the open recommendation on okay. the issue. But I can certainly get back to you. That's a very important issue and something we have been on top of and, and want to see implemented effectively. So I, I want you to know that in visiting some of the um, prisons and, and uh, jails across the country, the issue of the budget where uh, they said the women prison get the same budget, <clears throat> excuse me, as the men, but men do not need medications to help navigate through menopause. They don't have the female hygiene. So that is a different line item. And so that's one of the things I'm concerned about. And because they say 
that we're treating them equal, women inherently have different needs that would be a different line item. So that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to see those recommendations. But before I close, I want to commend the Office of the Inspector General for undertaking investigation into a few pressing issues and taking steps to understand how to strengthen public confidence in law enforcement is incredibly important. And the last question I have, we started a program in the state of Michigan where um, nonviolence, like blue collar um, inmates who wanted to learn a skilled trade or to be given some tools to make them a productive citizen when they leave. And we actually start training them when once they reach that term where they're close to probation. And then they're getting job offers before they leave prison. And we know that a skilled workforce is a really big issue. Can you share with me what, what your opinion is of that? And can we do that in our federal prisons? We, we certainly can do that. And one of the things that we've done as we've looked at these issues is look and see what other state what the states are doing. Because what we found in many areas is that the federal prisons could, can learn a lot from mm -hmm. what state systems are doing. And sometimes, mm -hmm. and many times, frankly, those systems have been further along in some of these areas. Um, and two, two things come to mind on the federal side that we've worked on and looked at. Um, federal prison industries. That is a very important program to help give skill sets to inmates mm -hmm. to transition out. I go back to what I said earlier. Inmates in the federal system are invariably going to be getting out of jail. These are not inmates who are in for life sentences. Exactly. These are inmates who are going to be back in our communities. We want them to be skilled. We want them to have mental health treatment. We want them to have good health care. We want to make sure they can move into a productive life, yeah. right? Because then they don't go back to prison. They don't create, they don't engage in violent crimes. Mm -hmm. It's very important. So federal prison industries, we've identified a series of challenges that they faced um, and that, um, they could be, and we have recommendations out there, and we will happy to get them to you and your staff on how that can be improved. There are many ways to do that, to give the vocational skills necessary to our inmates. And then on our release preparation program review, what's the, F, what's the federal prison system, the BOP, doing to get inmates ready for that transition? Mm -hmm. We've also looked at, by the way, halfway houses, and we've mm -hmm. identified concerns there. It's not clear to us whether the BOP, with the hundreds of millions of dollars this committee is investing in halfway houses, whether you're getting the value for that that we think we should be getting. There's really been, not, there, there hasn't been a hard look at that. And so there's a real question of whether transitioning inmates to halfway houses helps or hurts, as opposed to inmates who have homes to go to and communities to go to is transitioning them there through various release preparation programs. So happy to engage further with you on that. Thank you, and I want you to know that uh, I'll be willing to work with you to remove any barriers. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence, and uh, uh, thank you for raising that important question about the uh, efficacy of halfway house efforts and the advisability of spending that money. At this, at this time, the chair recognizes Congresswoman Grace Meng for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, and thank you, Inspector, for being here today. Um, I wanted to echo the comments and questions and concerns of my colleague, uh, Representative Brenda Lawrence, about ensuring that inmates have sufficient um, menstrual hygiene products in our uh, facilities. As you know, Congress passed legislation where inmates are supposed to receive um, these products, uh, be able to receive and access them free of charge. Um, and so, you know, just wanted to echo her concerns as well. Um, I wanted to ask about this um, last year or so where we've seen increased instances of uh, hate, hateful attacks and crimes against Asian Americans uh, throughout the country. 
um, the Asian American community has really been screaming for help for more than a year. Um, and we are very thankful for President Biden's uh, executive memorandum, which addresses, finally addresses uh, this issue. I also want to thank so many of my colleagues, including the leadership of the Black Caucus, Hispanic Caucus, uh, and so many others who have expressed solidarity and stood up in support of the Asian American community um, in this country, in, in Congress in the past year. And while I'm glad to see the Department of Justice stepping up to work on combating discrimination, um, you know, if you could tell me, I'm curious, uh, two questions. One, what actions, if any, did the Department of Justice take last year in 2020 to address the discrimination and violence against the Asian American community? Um, and two, has the department faced any challenges in addressing this anti-Asian violence? If so, what are they? What can Congress do to help? Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, those are obviously very critical issues. And um, uh, I will, first of all, follow up on what occurred you know, last year, I don't have any data right now in front of me, but those are that's a very important question, something I'm happy to touch on. I The, the department does and can address these issues in multiple ways. Um, obviously, the tragedy in Atlanta, the tragedy this week in Boulder demonstrates some of the issues here. Um, and it's not necessarily just from a law enforcement standpoint. The department's Office of Justice Programs um, has grant-making authority and grant issues grants to deal with discrimination and hate crimes and these issues. Um, and so it can look to be more effective and focused in where it's looking to address serious issues like this. Um, the Civil Rights Division obviously is involved in not only prosecuting hate crime issues, but in providing education and support to local communities on those issues. Um, and one of the things we've looked at in the past when issues about gun violence have come up, and I've had discussions at prior hearings with this committee on a bipartisan basis about how can the, uh, the NICS program, the background check system, be improved? How can ATF, from a regulatory standpoint, be more effective in its work? Um, and those are issues we've written about and identified as challenges for the department. And so I think all of those things are are areas where the Department of Justice at the federal level can work with local communities to try and address these problems. Thank you. And then, you know, um, I'm just also curious, I know that so many of us are pushing two pieces of legislation. One would also have a component where counseling is uh, recommended or required as part of sentencing uh, as well for people who may be um, convicted of hate crimes. Um, what do you think about that? And you know, just curious about your thoughts on that. Sure, absolutely. You know, I was on the Sentencing Commission, as the chairman mentioned, in the 2003 to 2009 period. And obviously, at BO, at, given our oversight responsibilities at BOP, we, we, we look at these issues. I think it's very important that there be strong programs in place. It's an area that we've written about and had concerns about, frankly, over the years, is the strength of the BOP programming in particular areas. When we've looked at these, what we've seen is strong programs at some institutions and, frankly, paper programs at others where they were going through the motions. And I think it's very important, again, with 120 plus institutions around the country, that the BOP work to institutionalize these programs so that they're being run effectively all across the country because as we know, as, as all of us know from, from the BOP, um, inmates are spread throughout the country and there isn't one institution that, for example, deals with only hate crime, inmates who are convicted of hate crimes. They could be at many institutions. So it's a very important question, something I'm, again, happy to speak with you further about, Congresswoman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Much. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Meng, a, a, a lady that we already knew was a fabulous multitasker. 
and now she's upped her game. We move to a second round of questions. Uh, for uh, <laughs> At the outset, I will recognize myself for five more minutes of questions. We've been talking about uh, uh, Bureau of Prisons, uh, Inspector General, and um, uh, your office has monitored the department's use of a billion dollars in CARES Act funding. It has also carried out many uh, so-called remote inspections, unquote, of diverse BOP institutions. Your reviews, while not exhaustive, have shown variation in BOP preparedness and response uh, and opportunities missed that might have reduced rates of transmission, illness, uh, and possibly saved lives. Now, while I know your office is working on uh, what you call a capstone analysis of lessons learned from BOP's pandemic response. What preliminary observations can you offer now about overall readiness before the pandemic struck in facilities and equipment, pr protocols and training? What have they fixed and what should they make a priority going forward? Mm -hmm. So uh, several issues that I think remain to be addressed and I've raised with department leadership. Um, First of all, testing. What we found was BOP was ill-equipped to deal with what it needed from a testing regime. And so what we saw in multiple institutions was BOP taking the steps it needed once an inmate became symptomatic, but not being able to test other inmates to see if they were asymptomatic. And what they learned as they started to get more testing available is that the spread resulted from asymptomatic inmates being left behind because they couldn't test. Test even no. with the vaccine, testing needs to continue and they need to have that testing capability first. Second, BOP, certainly many BOP institutions are gonna be challenged by their limited space to quarantine. And they need to in advance, think about that and be in a position to have inmates located in institutions where they have greater room, which they do in some, to quarantine, and think about managing inmate populations at facilities that have greater problems with quarantine. Third, staffing. Staffing shortages were exacerbated the problems that the BOP had. From a correctional officer standpoint, we've seen, we saw institutions where officers were being asked to do 18 hour plus days because they had to get people to the hospital, inmates to the hospital, which requires correctional officers to take them there, and then how to keep people behind, obviously, to fill those positions. Uh, medical issues, same thing, staffing. We heard over and over again from healthcare professionals about how the this, the, this shortages significantly impacted and strained their ability to respond to the COVID pandemic. Those have to be addressed. And okay. Then, how about uh, how about home confinement and compassionate release? Yeah, uh, yeah. Your report suggests they that those have been uh, may have been underused right. tools. Is that is that a fair statement? And if so, uh, what could BOP do better to leverage those tools? Exactly the next one I was going to mention, which was they clear they were not prepared to deal with on a granular level the compassionate release issue. We've written about this for many years that the BOP has not effectively used that authority. We identified that again in these reviews. What it needs to do is have a commitment from top down to the warden level and at the highest levels of the BOP to prepare in advance and look in advance at its inmate roster and assess inmates who are capable of moving to home confinement. And I'll, this is where halfway houses come in also. The current structure provides, generally speaking, that inmates go to halfway houses first. That, to my mind, is a problem in a pandemic. There's not necessarily a value in going from a institution to a halfway house if you could go to a home, precisely right. because you want to be quarantined or socially distant. Okay, uh, last question, which is a, a big question. BOP received, $100 million in CARES Act funding, supplemented by $300 million more in the FY21 appropriations bill. Uh, can you share any preliminary observations 
about how well those funds have been used? So um, we have seen evidence of their push to address some of the staffing issues. I can't give you a granular level at this point, but we can follow up on that and see how that money has been used. And we certainly will with regard to the COVID related funding as we continue to follow up on that. Um, but that I would say is uh, one of their highest priority needs from the work we've done is filling those staffing gaps on the correctional officer side, the mental health side, the, the healthcare side generally. It's an issue that not only goes to um, the security of the institution, but it goes overall to the well being of correctional officers and inmates. It is a cross cutting issue, you know, on, on all fronts. Thank you for, for saying that. You know that's a, a big concern of mine, the staffing uh, uh, shortfalls. And, and we will continue to focus on that. At this time, I'd like to recognize Ranking Member Adderholt for five more uh, minutes of questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, and um, I just, I, I'm, my clock is not appearing. Uh, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, so you might just uh, speak up, Mr. Chairman, when my uh, time has uh, elapsed. Um, in response, uh, Ms. Horowitz, to the uh, persistent management challenge, your office has stated that, quote, despite the critical nature of utilizing performance data, many department components lack either meaningful performance measures or data necessary to evaluate their programs, end of quote. Uh, in 2018, uh, in response to recommendations from your office and the uh, GAO, the Executive Office of Immigration Review implemented new case uh, completion metrics, and that was an effort to ensure that immigration courts were operating efficiently and also operating appropriately. President Biden has pledged to roll back the immigration judge performance metrics that have helped lead to record number of immigration cases being completed. Given the immigration caseload and its growth of nearly 60% in less than two years, to what extent does eliminating the case uh, completion metrics concern you? So, you know, I continue to think it's very important to have metrics available to assess effectiveness. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not um, in a position at this point to assess how that may or may not affect um, the the case movement. Um, we we're not obviously looking at that right now, but I do think, and I agree with you completely, it's very important to have those kind of metrics in place. And if these are going to be changed, that there be other metrics that are appropriate to to make an assessment. Um, there there needs to be an ability to move these cases forward. We've identified this as a problem specifically with regard to the Executive Office of Immigration Review, as you know, from our reports about their problems years earlier. And so um, this is something that um, I, I'm certainly happy to have us continue to follow up on to see what is happening with those metrics and what it means for case management. Do you, do you have any reason to believe that the performance, performance metrics uh, impeded due process? Um, I don't know whether they did or did not. I, as I sit here today, we are doing a review on the video teleconferencing capabilities and how the department and EOR was handling those and its overall docket. And so I will have greater insight into that in the coming months um, as to how that program has worked. Um, I, I will say during the pandemic, what we saw was the weaknesses in EUR's ca video capabilities early on and its technological limitations adversely affected their ability to continue to move forward. So they do need to continue to move forward on their IT infrastructure and architecture. Oh, you mentioned about the importance uh, that you felt like was important that we do have uh, the metrics there. How can case uh, completion benchmarks improve efficiency of the docket? And how can the Justice Department utilize such benchmarks without being accused of imposing quotas 
on our immigration judges. So, um, you know, we, I'll give a parallel to, to what we do. We have time completion standards for our agents and general goals. Uh, what, but we're also sensitive to the notion that we don't want cases pursued um, overly aggressively to try and meet a timeline, a deadline that in some cases shouldn't be applied or close cases simply because someone can't meet them where there could be some wrongdoing. It's similar on the judicial front. You want to have some metrics in place, some time uh, lines in place for how to manage cases, but you also want to build in flexibility for what are inevitably going to be more complex matters, more challenging matters, so that um, you're not doing a one size fits all with every single case. And I think that's very important to build into these metrics. Um, and then being able to do what we do, frankly, the first line of accountability is at the management level. Eeyore and the department need to look at what's going on and say, these are working well or not going well. And then we're there as a, se I'll say a second line of defense to go and see if that oversight is being done uh, effectively. And if not, to report out our recommendations for how to improve it. Well, notwithstanding the, the pandemic that we uh, have gone through the last year, uh, what do you see as the most significant factors that uh, are driving the uh, this uh, burgeoning caseload uh, at the uh, Executive Office of Immigration Review? Would it be too few immigration judges? Is it the difficulty in the hiring process? Is it poor case management? Uh, uh, I mean, completion performance? Is it continuances, uh, lack of courtroom space? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we've we've heard those issues across the board in terms of challenges and issues. Um, clearly, as as the caseload increases, it, there's a certain point at which you can't simply expect judges to handle more and more cases. Um, they're they're going to hit a maximum threshold. And so resources clearly become an issue as the caseload continues to burgeon. Uh, we've heard about concerns about space and available space. We've seen challenges with paper filings and paper dockets and what that means in today's world. Uh, paper dockets, frankly, don't make much sense except as a backup, not as a primary tool. And so moving electronically your operations would increase efficiencies. Um, so it, in some respects, I think it may well be in all of the above, but I think in the next few months, I'll have a better sense for you of perhaps which ones are more significant than others. And uh, uh, <clears throat> ranking member Adderholt, that's, uh, that's five minutes if you're not keeping track, if yep. you can't see yep. that. Yep, okay. So, Thank, uh, you. Thank you for those questions. And at this point, the chair recognizes uh, Congressman Dutch Rupersberger for five minutes of questions. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, first thing, uh, I want to ask you about the solar wind attacks mm -hmm. as it relates to the Department of Justice and actions to address this problem moving forward. Now, the solar wind cyber attack showed our cybersecurity vulnerabilities uh, and major corporations uh, it showed our, our cybersecurity vulnerabilities from major corporations to a large number of federal departments and agencies. The Department of Justice also had the unfortunate honor of having a secondary attack against DOJ systems that allowed the attackers to assess 3% or 3,500 of the department's emails. Solar winds is alarming because this shows how vulnerable our systems are. But this attack uh, also shows us that with a few tweaks from the attackers, an intelligence gathering mission could easily move toward malicious destruction. Now, my question is, number one, can you update us on DOG's response and what steps the department is taking to mitigate this moving forward? And how have you worked with CISA and NSA to help formulate what DOJ has done right and what they have done wrong? And then also, uh, can you give us an update on what your interactions and discussions are with other department inspector generals uh, that have produced 
did you come up with the best practices or find common entry points to federal IT networks? Thank you, Congressman. Obviously, the solar winds issue is a critical issue sure. for the department and for the government. Um, for our country, this, it shows up on our bill. For the country, absolutely. Um, I'm going to be limited in what I can say in this setting about, frankly, any of the yeah, information that we've learned. Um, so I'm happy to follow up with you in a in a classified setting to talk about that further. Um, but we are, I can tell you, we are we have been in touch with uh, department officials, CIO to make sure we're aware of and understand what occurred um, and where the weaknesses, vulnerabilities might have been um, because we continue to do our FISMA related work and we need to know that for that purpose as well as obviously the implications here of that. I've also been in touch with other IGs including the NSA IG and others in the intelligence community. This has been a topic of conversation among those of us I'm one of them in the intelligence community IG forum. Um, and we are comparing notes. And again, I'll be limited in how much I can say here, but we are comparing notes across our information that we've gathered to try and understand how we can pursue oversight in this space and ensure that the agencies we oversee are taking the steps they need to take to address it. And again, I'm happy to talk about that further in yeah. classified environment. And, and, you know, solar winds were such a wake up call uh, for, you know, we're, I mean, we're dealing with Russia and China, and then we have the, the Iran and the North Korea and, and, and that type of thing. Yeah. Just one other issue that, that I think came up and in, in was the fact that um, high level department, department officials who use, were using personal devices to conduct government business. Now, has that been rectified? What was that issue? So um, we've seen this in multiple situations, frankly, where line agents up to the F former FBI director were using devices, personal devices, to engage in government-related business. As you know, everybody in the federal government knows that's a security issue. Um, and we need to address that. The department needs to address it. We have made multiple recommendations on that. It's, it's both a training issue and an accountability issue, frankly. You need to not only train people, but then if they cross a line, you, you need to address it. And it doesn't matter whether it's the highest level official or the line prosecutor agent, non-prosecutor, non-agent. We've got to get drill that into people's heads um, that they can't use personal devices in very limited circumstances it's allowed, but they can't use personal devices for sensitive information usage. It, it's it's an easy passage into our systems. Okay, well, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, over to Congressman Klein for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, you talked about strengthening public confidence in law enforcement, so I want to go down to your portion of your testimony that talks about protecting individuals' privacy and. Uh, the dual reports on FISA, uh, the December 2019 review finding fundamental and serious deficiencies in connection with that FBI applications for FISA warrants and a March 2020 follow-on report identifying significant concerns with the factual accuracy documentation process known as Woods procedures. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Woods procedures, what problems your office uncovered when reviewing the failures of the FBI to follow those procedures and whether you're confident that they're now in compliance with Woods procedures to ensure that each fact in a FISA application is supported with documentation? So the Woods procedures were put in place, as you know, Congressman, about 20 years ago by, by the FBI following failures that were identified in FISA court proceedings. And they're designed to ensure that the FBI documents every fact asserted in a FISA. Um, and the concern we've identified recently after doing our December 2019 FISA report was widespread um, problems with documentation. We found issues where we couldn't find a Woods file and neither could the FBI. We identified numerous um, errors in the terms of documentation in FISAs where there was a Woods file. And that doesn't mean necessarily that the underlying FISA 
was not supported ultimately by probable cause. That obviously is for a court to decide, not the OIG. But it does show a sloppiness that can lead to the problems that led to the implementation of the Woods procedures 20 years ago. So we're about, we've, we're about to issue our final report on that. So you'll see that soon. Um, but what our concern is, is that the FBI take the steps it needs to ensure that people understand the importance of getting every fact right. And that slip ups here or there can lead to bigger and bigger problems. And so we're seeing steps being taken by the FBI leadership to do that. And we're gonna follow it carefully as is I know the FISA court, which has also issued orders in this regard because of its concern. And I, and I thank you for that. I don't know what exactly what your timeline is for your final report, but uh, I'm glad to hear it's coming soon. Um, I, I would characterize what you, uh, or what you characterize as slip ups, I would call something different um, and, and intentional uh, lies, quite frankly. Uh, let me let me follow up. Three provisions of FISA expired last year. Has your office looked into how the FBI is functioning without those capabilities? So let me just on the slip up, but my comment about that was about not the reports we've done earlier, but rather what can happen if you ignore this. You end up with maybe minor failures, but gotcha. they become bigger failures. That's what I meant, just to clarify. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the uh, expiration of the FISAs, um, I don't know exactly how it's impacted them. Um, I know it became a concern about a year ago when the um, expiration occurred, but um, I frankly had not been engaged by the department and have not um, engaged with the FBI and how this has impacted them over the last year during the pandemic. It, it, the pandemic has impacted, frankly, our ability to do some of this follow-up work because of the travel restrictions and the restrictions on getting in skiffs and other limitations. Do you Are you aware of any special rules that exist when submitting a FISA application to uh, surveil a political campaign? So um, the um, department has in fact now put in place new procedures and rules to address that concern and that issue. Um, so there are now some procedures in place. We're gonna follow up. We're getting the reports of those. We've been, it's been told to us. We're gonna continue to follow up on that to ensure effective implementation and to make sure what we're being told is in fact accurate, because as you know, we don't simply accept what we're told. We certainly take it in, but then we do the follow-up to make sure it, it in fact has taken place. I appreciate that. And uh, has your office or, or anyone at, at uh, DOJ taken a position on whether a FISA hearing should be held anytime the government seeks to conduct such surveillance on a, on a political campaign? Yeah, I, I don't know what the department's position is on that. I think it's been widely understood how significant an event that is and how a decision like that, as we noted in our report, really needs to go to the highest levels of the department, the attorney general, the deputy attorney general, and not be left, as could have been the case previously, to much lower level employees. Thank you for that information. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Klein. And uh, uh, at this point, the chair recognizes uh, Congressman Trone for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could just follow up quickly uh, on the comments Congresswoman Lawrence made, if you could get back to my office on three points, mm -hmm. uh, I'll have my staff reach out. One is the value of your thoughts on halfway houses if mm -hmm. it's a good idea, a bad idea, but we sometimes just keep spending money uh, yep. because we spent it the year before. Um, I like change, and we don't want to spend money we don't have, and we want to spend it and be effective. Second point would be the data and insights on release preparation programs. Mm -hmm. uh, my visits in the prisons, I have seven in my district, yeah. um, have not uh, been that encouraging. And the third point would be skills training for that. Uh, I would say that's been not encouraging either. That's a follow-up on those uh, points. Yep. Your 19 report, uh, the top management performance challenges facing 
DOJ, it was the name of your report, yeah. found recidivism reduction remains major challenge. Mm -hmm. Commission said nearly half the federal offenders released in 05 rearrested within eight years. Effective reentry program is an important part of this. We all agree. So the bureaus face challenges collecting the data. And this is what mm -hmm. Congressman Klein's been talking about, and I completely agree with him. Data is gold to make good decisions. So connecting this data regarding performance and effectiveness as it relates to recidivism. So what finds the findings of the IG made on the biggest contributors to lack of accurate and reliable performance data regarding the department's programs and what recommendations you have that we can address this data insufficiency issue? So, um, Congressman, those are, uh, you know, raised several important points. And, and um, first and foremost, one of the challenges we've seen in, in the department's data collection efforts is, frankly, the challenges of its own IT systems and infrastructure and its capa capacity and capabilities. Um, we now have a data analytics cap capacity and capability, thanks to the committee's support for that effort, that is far advanced compared to what the department's um, components can do, including the BOP. As an example, when we started to look at healthcare records, we learned that most BOP institutions still got paper records. They weren't using electronic medical records. When we looked at recidivism issues, we found the department wasn't effectively tracking and gathering data so that it could make an assessment of recidivism rates and figure out which programs are working, which programs aren't. When we did our compassionate release review for elderly inmates, we all, and compassionate release just generally, we ended up doing our own recidivism review by getting information about the inmates released, going to the FBI and getting the um, recidivism data from the FBI and comparing it. But that's the kind of information I think should be readily available to department leadership when they're looking at something that critical like compassionate release or release preparation programs. All right, so how do we get your department to lay out what we need to bring the uh, BOP into the 20, 21st century? I mean, because without these data, uh, we can't address recidivism. We're gonna keep spending $80 billion a year. We need to invest up front, get the data, then we can understand the outcomes, then we can get solutions. Uh, but we gotta go ahead and bite the bullet and, and get the data collection done, and if they're using pen and pencil, that's a loser. Yep. And, and look, it starts with, first of all, we've made recommendations in this regard, and we can, you know, as, as we're talking about the three issues you identified, add this to the list. We've made recommendations about this. I, I, I think um, primarily it involves uh, uh, the department, department leadership, working with BOP leadership, to figure out what are our priorities, how are we gonna to get to a space where we can get the data and collect the data and be in a position to make assessments, and then go, you know, obviously through the budget process to support it, whatever's needed there. But there needs to be long-term thinking. I think that's one of the things that sometimes can be a challenge with budgeting one year at a time, and frankly, right. when budgets don't get done until the fiscal year is six months in. Let me ask one more quick question if the chairman will indulge me that follows up on this exact point. Send me the other data you mentioned. I'd like to see that also, add that yeah. to my list. But part of this reducing recidivism is linking community-based programs, the prisons, especially substance use, mental health, and employment. And it's especially now true with COVID. So what does the IG found regarding efficacy of these community programs, social support services, provided by the residential reentry program management centers we just spoke about versus uh, to those on home confinement. So we haven't done our own uh, undertaking to look at the community-based programs to ourselves sort of get into the, the local communities and look at this. What we've done is looked at the halfway houses and gone and said, okay, what's the evidence that you have that these programs, that the halfway houses are working well that the programs that they're supporting are working well. And again, we're stuck with an absence of data. 
So that's again an area where we've made recommendations that the BOP needs to look at halfway house programs and look at those community-based programs and are they working effectively? Is it better than, for example, sending people to their homes instead of a halfway house? And if it is, you're talking about obviously a substantial amount of money that can be reinvested in other places. But until you actually know what you're getting, what your money's buying from the halfway houses beyond what you assume it's buying, you're not gonna be in a position to figure out what's the best and highest use of the money. That's been our challenge over the years. Agreed, thank you so much, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Charler. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Garcia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Inspector General, I just want to kind of button up the, the tail end of the conversation we were having on the last round with uh, regards to the, the body cams. Uh, do, do you have a uh, an explicit uh, ask of, of uh, us here in this committee to help with the funding to make sure that we are getting the body cam hardware, firmware, software, as well as all the Sustain a lot of the cost in the body cam is actually on the maintenance and the and the the documentation and the memorialization of of the video. Is is that already something in work with us that that you're requesting? Um, it isn't. We're we're finishing up our audit and our review that we're going to get to the department and publicly to you um, about these issues. And partly that's going to be you know that's one of the issues we're seeing is the again. You, as you just indicated, you can't go down the road of body-worn cameras until you have policy in place on how to deal with it mm -hmm. and an understanding of what kind of funding and infrastructure you're gonna need, like local communities have figured out. How is it gonna call it? What kind of camera, not only what kind of cameras are you gonna use, but what are you gonna do with the data? How long are you gonna keep it for? Where are you gonna store it? Security issues around that, right? All of those things that local communities have figured out, that's, got to happen at the federal level. Yeah, okay, good. Well, I think we're all looking forward to that. I think the feedback we're getting from local law enforcement uh, to include sheriffs, uh, police department, uh, municipal county police departments, is that it's, uh, it is benefiting not only the police officers, but also the public. It's taken a lot of the ambiguity out of the, uh, uh, you know, the arbitration and the sort of determination within the, a lot of these uh, uh, audits and, and, and investigations on the backside. So looking forward to supporting you, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony, uh, you, we had shortages and in, in what sounded like recruiting and retention issues in terms of personnel. Um, can you touch on what's driving that? And, and more importantly, what can we do to help? Um, I, I know as as the headcount gets more and more uh, constrained, they get overworked. That actually aggravates the retention problem, which then uh, uh, makes it tougher to recruit as well. And, and it's sort of a, a, a death spiral in many ways. How can we stop this uh, bleeding and how do we uh, kind of turn it around and help you get whole again? Hmm. So I, I think the challenge for example, for the BOP in some locations is a pay challenge. Um, it's, it, these are, extremely challenging jobs, as we all know. Um, sure. And if you're in a metropolitan area um, paying one rate, um, it's gonna be a hard time getting that recruiting um, undertaken. And then I, I can speak to the challenge just generally about onboarding personnel from my own agency and from every other government leader I've heard. It's a challenge getting people on. It can take months and months and months. The lag time, it's easy to lose somebody. If people want to leave, they leave within a few weeks. It can take months to get a hiring um, announcement out and get people through the background checks, the drug testing, all the things that go with being hired as a correctional officer in particular. So I, I think there needs to be a sustained effort to figure out how to move forward and anticipate you're going to have departures better so that you can get ahead of losing people at some level. Um, right. And, and that's it, a challenge. It, it doesn't seem, uh, it, it, it may be aggravated in the last maybe year or so with this, uh, with this push to defund the police and law enforcement, but it's still not something that's unpredictable. It's something that a lot of organizations and businesses deal with uh, regularly, especially with, with uh, the cost of living and, and the, in, the impending inflation challenges. Uh, do you think that we, we are adequately capturing 
the need to attract talent if it's a money problem uh, are we are we doing a good enough job of of baking that into budget requests so that we we can actually get people on board so that we can actually keep people on board uh, so that we can throw more personnel and resources at the the, the background investigations and the and security clearance process if that's needed uh, is that adequately captured in the budget request right now at the at the DOJ level? I, I think that's a the very important issue that you've identified, Congressman. And the GAO report recently about the Bureau, Bureau of Prisons on this highlights it, right? It's, you need to step back and think about what are your staffing needs and what are the metrics that support what you're asking for? And what they found was the BOP hadn't done that basic work that it needed to do. And then they need to sit down in the budgeting process and they need a seat at the table at the highest levels that say, this is what we need. And then they need to be able to come to you and they testify and say, Appropriators, here's what we need to do this job effectively and to secure and make the prison safe. I'll give you a parallel. We're doing this review right now on judicial security, an extraordinarily serious issue that the marshals have responsibility for. And that report's going to be out in the next couple of months, maybe sooner than that. We're finishing it up. Uh, and that's a similar question. What are your metrics for what you need to protect judges? Sit down and have an honest discussion at the highest levels of the department and with the appropriators. And let's figure out what you need to make sure that judicial security is handled appropriately. Similar issue to prison security. I just think they, yep. that kind of thinking has to go on. And it's critical, as you said. Yeah, I'm new to this game and I'm blown away that that's not fundamental in this process already. But I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, Inspector General. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And we're going to uh, move to a final uh, lightning round. Uh, and uh, Inspector General, you've uh, you've uh, worn down most of this subcommittee, uh, <laughs> so you, you can brag about that back at the office. Um, but I want to pick up um, where we just left off. You were talking about um, federal marshal service, um, and um, uh, that's that's something that I've been interested in. Uh, the U.S. Marshal Service has really had a daunting challenge with the pandemic. Uh, it had a detainee population of 61,000, 70 percent of them under intergovernmental agreements, IGAs, spread across 873 state and county facilities. Uh, detainees have to be moved between facilities and, and courts are at high risk of spreading contagious disease. You found the Marshal Service facility oversight plans were inadequate. Now, you found that uh, and that they did not ensure CDC guidance was followed. You, you also observed that the Marshal Service did not apply the same scrutiny to monitoring its IGA facilities as compared to contract managed ones, in part because they lacked the control that existed with the contract arrangements. You also noted that the Marshal Service transported prisoners without testing to confirm they were COVID negative. And the Marshal Service generally agreed with your findings and committed to implement the six recommendations in your audit by the end of this month. Are you confident that they will? And please explain why or why not. Well, um, we'll see. The proof will be in the details. Um, so I'm hopeful they will. I, I, I'll hold my answer on whether I'm confident they will till I see what they report back to us. Um, but um, they told us their commitment is there. I believe in what they have said to us, but we'll test it when we get it, um, their report on this. Um, very, it's very important, as you said, that they take these steps. Um, we've learned a lot in the last year um, the, from the BOP and the marshals. They can do much better than occurred a year ago. And we'll see. This will be the first report back from them on that. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's stay in touch about that. Yes. Uh, finally, I want to talk about violent crime. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, the Department of Justice launched several initiatives targeting violent crime, particularly in seven cities that were seeing a surge in violence, notably Operation Relentless Pursuit, followed by Operation Legend, which also involved cooperation with state and local law enforcement. There's also been an increase in targeted violence, specifically hate crimes, such as the recent attacks on Asian Americans in Atlanta, and elsewhere, the 2019 massacre at the El, 
Paso, Walmart in Texas, the 2018 Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, and, the, and of course, the Charleston sh church shooting in 2015. Your office is currently reviewing DOJ's strategic plan and accountability measures, including coordination across prosecution, law enforcement, and grant making components. The review will also assess the department's strategic plan for aiding communities that are confronting significant increases in homicides and gun violence. Have you uh, any preliminary observations or recommendations for actions the new attorney general can take to best leverage DOJ resources to deal with violent crime? Um, I will say at a high level, what we've seen is that in connection with violent crime, the, the first and foremost critical piece of that for the federal government is strong, as you indicated, partnerships with state and local law enforcement and beyond state and local law enforcement, community leaders. Uh, it, 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 it's not gonna work as a, the feds run in with their law enforcement and fix the violent crime problem. It's got to be a cooperative, close working relationship. Um, having been an AUSA and a prosecutor in Manhattan back in the 90s, you know, it, it's clear that the local law enforcement is on the ground and understands communities better than anybody if they're doing their jobs well. And that's where the partnerships have to come up. Community leaders know that. They understand where the violent crime is, they understand where the gang problem is. Right, they're the ones that need to have that working relationship with federal law enforcement. So first and foremost, I would say that would be my first recommendation in that regard. Who's ever thinking about a program like that is the feds. It's unlikely that the federal law enforcement is gonna be able to do it alone and go alone. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Horowitz. And I'm gonna recognize uh, uh, Mr. Garcia again for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief, Inspector General. I, I think just in your in your professional opinion and everything that you've seen throughout your career, uh, do you think at the DOJ level, whether whether it's the FBI, DEA, ATF, uh, the Marshals, uh, I, and I and I think also to include BOP, that we're we are doing enough as a nation right now to to hold the the folks who are involved in these these international these transnational criminal organizations uh that are facilitating this this crisis at the border right now uh it's it, it's not a new thing it's gotten worse over the last uh three months but it's it's been an ongoing struggle for our our country um th this is something that if we don't do it correctly it actually aggravates your problems internally it aggravates the recruiting and retention problems that you have with your personnel uh, but at a macro level, it's it's absolutely one of the the biggest threats to our nation's security right now, um, and it is a federal problem, right? This is this is happening in a few states along our southern border, but these people are being uh, smuggled and 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 then indentured uh, as servants throughout uh, the 50 states of the nation. Here, uh, are are we doing enough? And in your opinion, what what should we be doing? Uh, if if you don't mind, just giving us your perspective. Well, I'll just say from a DOJ perspective um, and just generally from having dealt with issues that are broad based and cross cutting, um, I, I think very important that this is the, the border issues are not just a DHS issue, a DOJ issue, a State Department issue, pick your agency right. uh, to, to address that and look at that. And the transnational crime problem is a perfect example of that. There are law enforcement agencies, obviously, at DOJ that need to be involved in that, as obviously prosecutors need to be critically involved in that. But DHS has key responsibilities that they have to work effectively with DOJ law enforcement. There can't be an us versus them mentality. They need to be engaged with the State Department because they have primary responsibility for managing overseas posts. When law enforcement goes and works in country in many foreign countries, as you know, that we're operating, they work through the ambassador. So you have to have a strong State Department relationship, right? And mm -hmm. I could add other entities as well. The intelligence side of the house needs to be engaged mm -hmm. because you need strong intelligence to deal with these issues. 
And while the FBI is an intelligence agency, they're obviously not a go it alone on that. They need foreign, they need foreign counterparts to be part mm-hmm. of that discussion as well. So I, I think that's something that is people are looking at border issues, transnational crime issues. The hard questions to ask are, how are you interacting? How are you addressing it not only internally from your own budget priorities and your own um, strategic plans, but how are you making sure that you're leveraging the, the needs that you have from State Department, DHS, foreign agency counterparts, intelligence community counterpart, counterparts, because the problem isn't going to be solved by the F, by saying go FBI to the border. And, and frankly, I don't think it's solved necessarily by saying to the border prosecutors, and we saw a little bit about you know this challenge, go arrest mm-hmm. everybody. Um, that didn't get to the outcome that people wanted either. And even the even the most supportive prosecutors raised concern about that as well. So I think that's really what has to happen. And that's really one of the learnings from our zero tolerance policy report is the importance of the whole of government approach and not just saying the department, a handful of people saying, let's go try and do this and see what happens. Yeah, well said. That, that makes sense. I, I completely agree and resonate with that. I, uh, that, that that's a, a very good good point. My inference is uh, from your comment is that we, we really right now are not optimized from one department or agency to the next um, outside of the DOJ to others. Uh, so I think we should work work for that. Um, at a at a very macro level, I think our our strongest challenge right now, and these are my words, not yours. I, I don't want to put you in a bad position, but uh, we don't, as a nation, have a holistic approach to to this challenge right now, and it feels like it is uh, a, a strategy of denying that there's a problem uh, and and a whack a mole approach at, at certain state levels who are trying to do the right thing uh, while our nation is being overrun by by uh, a very porous border and, and illegal immigrants. Uh, so I, my, I'm hopeful that this administration can provide us with that holistic uh, national security strategy to hopefully end this crisis soon and allow the various agencies to uh, start working together in the interest of of making sure that we can survive as a nation. Thank you, Inspector General, for your time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And uh, Inspector General Horowitz, you have uh, a long way to go before you wear down Representative David Trone, who is recognized for another five minutes. I'm sorry, sir, you've been a trooper. I really thank you, Uh, but this is an area of special interest to me, the Bureau of Prisons. I wanna pile on Chairman Cartwright's comments about uh, the U.S. Marshal Services um, I have a lot of excellent members of AFGE uh, in my uh, facility in Cumberland, Maryland, uh, and many of them also work in the facility in Hazleton, West Virginia, that live in my district. And these members have been very adversely affected by what the marshals' lack of COVID protocols have been. And after a bout of that, we over 82 inmates and numerous staff come down and test COVID positive. So we appreciate your input on this. Let's jump over to the first step implementation, criminal justice reform. We got out of the gate. It wasn't a big step, but it was the first step. We've got a declining inmate population. Mm -hmm. And as Chairman Cartwright mentioned, significant staff shortages. The First Step Act required the IRC to do a report and we spoke last week to the head of BOP about this, that said even a full return to pre-COVID BOP programming levels will not be sufficient to make available evidence-based recidivism reduction programs and productive activities for all of the eligible prisoners in custody by January 22, as the first step requires. So we're not even getting done what we said we're going to do. And I'm sure there's a lot of excuses for that. Uh, But at the end of the day, can you just tell us a couple things, short and sweet, uh, that we've got to help to address the staffing shortage? Because if we don't get the staffing right, as Mr. Garcia talked about, it's a vicious cycle. We lose the existing people. We don't, we spend money on training and we don't, Receive, achieve our outcome, which is 
reducing recidivism. So what do we need to get done to help reduce these, recruit, retain? Quickly. So I think, first of all, the BOP has to come up with its institution by institution issues. Some institutions are not understaffed. Other institutions are significantly understaffed. They've got to come up with what's our shortage of correctional officers, what's our shortage of healthcare workers and other staff and come forward and get to the department's leadership and get before the appropriators and say, here's our shortages, here's how we've calculated and determined them, and this is the funding we need to meet those challenges, first step. Second action is then to proactively plan and address those shortages, rather than wait for vacancies, rather than, frankly, wait for um, decisions to be made necessarily. Given the months lag, Again, I'm doing this in my own agency. We hire often ahead of vacancies because I know every year I'm going to have X number of retirements or resignations. That, you know, and I have 500 employees. It's a lot easier with 30,000 employees to understand right what the annual turnover is likely to be. I think that proactive planning is critical, but I really think it starts with reading the GAO report understanding what your staffing needs are institution by institution. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I own a business uh, with 200 and some locations around uh, 27 states. I've got 11,000 plus uh, employees that work for me. Right. And we do our staffing eight weeks in advance. We never look at today. We look at where we're going to be in right. two months from now to take up that lag time. And we anticipate retirements. We in the management ranks, we anticipate, you know, folks are going to turn over. So we overstaff to properly staff. Right. And we do that thoughtfully, and that gets us better outcomes. So we are totally aligned on this. Um, it's just management 101. Um, can you have your team figure out how my team can get a report? Because it is Absolutely. facility by facility. And my yeah. 200 stores... I've got 150 that are perfect. I got 25 or 30 that are struggling and I got 20 losers and they just generally aren't focusing on staffing. Generally it's a lack of focus. It's not always the people just aren't there. That's what they say. And they don't say they don't have enough pay. That's what they say. But a lot of that's just BS and that the people are there, but they aren't prioritizing staffing first. And if you don't have enough people, then you don't have the right people, you'll never be successful. This is yep. not complicated. So if you can get us the report yep. on so, what the staffing is, the allocated staffing at those multiple hundred facilities, and then where they are today, mm -hmm. and then we can force rank them worst to best. And then we can try and push BOP as to say, you can do better than this. Because we can't meet the first step. We can't do what we've committed to do to these returning citizens. And then it costs taxpayers lots and lots of money. Yep. So I appreciate your help. Absolutely. Look forward to working with you on this, Congressman, because I agree. I could talk about these issues for a long time. Yes. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Trown. And uh, General Horowitz, uh, thank you for your testimony here today. Uh, I, re I remind you, as I remind all members, uh, that further questions may be submitted to you in connection with this hearing. Uh, an email address has already been circulated to all the members and their staffs. Uh, and so, uh, General Horowitz, you may be getting further written questions, uh, and we will, we, will, uh, we will appreciate your prompt answers to those. Uh, again, thank you for attending today, General Horowitz, and uh, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.